Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of Duo Talk, hosted by myself, Matthew McAllister, and Matthew Cochran. We are absolutely delighted about tonight's show, and I actually have a guest live here in the Gallery of Guitar. Uh, Nicholas Howman, all the way from Berlin, is with us, and we also have Drew Henderson, um, dialed in from Canada. Um, so we have an amazing uh, panel tonight. We might have Matthew Anderson joining us, uh, hopefully through the stream, if he can make it as well. Um, and welcome to all of you watching out there across YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. Um, we're really delighted to have the wide guitar community coming in on this topic tonight all about recording guitar and the videography and the audio, everything behind making guitar recorders, everything from doing it in your house to some of the incredible content that both of these gentlemen uh, create and share with us all. Um, so uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you want to ask a question during um, the chat tonight, feel free to do so. You do it by way of making a comment. Just make a comment on YouTube if you're watching there, a comment on Twitter, and likewise a comment on Facebook if you're watching the live stream there. We will see those comments and we will do our best uh, to answer them um, if we can. Um, so welcome to you all. We'll be about an hour, just over an hour tonight, and we've got lots of nice clips of some of the, the beautiful work created by our amazing creators that are with us this evening um, and we'll share that throughout the evening as well so welcome to you all sit back um, I think we've all got a little glass of something here in uh, in Glasgow um, and uh, look at that we're all we're all we're all we're all doing our best here you know? that's that's all we can say Drew is winning the competition <laughs> yeah clearly whatever golden amber that is <laughs> <laughs> like a ruling <laughs> but listen I'm going to hand over to Matthew Crockett now just for a little bit more of a formal introduction to to both Nico and Drew. Well, welcome, Drew and uh, Nicholas, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Matthew and I have been really looking forward to this uh, conversation, for, actually for months now. Uh, and I'd like to start by asking each of you to describe your, what I'm assuming is a pretty unique journey uh, from musician to musician slash audio and video producer. Uh, Drew, why don't, we, uh, why don't we start with you? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's that's kind of a long story, but um, um, I felt it necessary at a certain point to make my own recordings after doing a studio recording and kind of seeing how it worked behind the scenes and thinking to myself, you know what, I think I can probably do this. So uh, the music store and the music school I was working at at the time had a little... Um, audio video department and uh, my friend ran that and he hooked me up with some some very basic equipment but that really started this this whole journey of um, starting to record myself and then it snowballs and people like the, the work that you do and you start recording your friends and then you start acquiring better and better and better equipment and then you start branching out to more professionals so um, I'm, so yes I'm basically completely self-taught and specialized only in, in guitar, although um, my work at the Royal Conservatory allows me to record all sorts of other instruments now. So just in the past couple of months, I feel like I've really um, broadened my horizons as an engineer. So, um, and on the video side of things, um, that was really just a fluke. <laughs> I, I kind of bought a camera because I was sort of interested in photography mainly, but cameras are so great these days that they double as beautiful video cameras. Mm -hmm. So just one day I, I thought to myself, well, why don't I try to make a video and put it on YouTube or something like that? <laughs> and I was very pleased with the results and I really enjoyed the process. So it, much like the audio side of things, you know, started acquiring more equipment and learning more and more and more. Like with me, when I really get into something, it's, it's kind of an obsession. So, um, yeah, so both of those things kind of followed one another. And uh, yes, we just just kind of get to the point where we are today and, you know, recording lots of great colleagues all over the world. Yeah, I was going to say, when you said you were recording your friends, you know, I mean, you've got some pretty awesome uh, yeah. friends there, you know, <laughs> um, you've recorded over the years, you know, um, pretty, some pretty, you've, you've uh, you know, sort of not only just people going to you, obviously, for your expertise, but you must feel a real sense of like privilege getting to work with some of these incredible artists as well. It's amazing. I, I mean, I, those are some of the best memories I have are working with, you know, solo duo or filming Petra or or even um, some things you haven't seen, like um, 
working with Norbert Kraft, who lives about 20 minutes north of me, you know. So it's really great fun, the whole, the whole process. And yeah, I do feel quite privileged to have worked with those people. Mm. Well, we will definitely be unpacking some of those details. Uh, Nicholas, how about uh, how, how about you? What about your journey? Well, um, I think I can, like a lot of stuff is easily doubled. It's a long journey, <laughs> but um, working together with friends in the end is what, what's the outcome. Uh, just the start for me, and I have to add, like I didn't start this whole videography thing alone. I did it with Hendrik Schacht, who also studied classical guitar with me. I actually invited him to his own housewarming party before I met him. So, <laughs> um, and then that's a yeah, funny story on the side. Uh, that's for another time. And Hendrik and I were both in our masters. And I have to say that the need for us to film came out of pure protest against what we saw was the existing situation of the classical guitar scene, which is very much a bubble. Um, and we found ourselves in a situation where we really didn't want to study ourselves into that kind of work environment and uh, knew so many people who were um, always saying something in that direction, like, yeah, this is also, and this is well, and kind of complaining, but I never really saw anybody doing something against it. So we were like, if so many cool people are complaining, why don't we like start our own like community network kind of thing? So that was a huge drive behind it. And then Hendrik and I started filming ourselves. Um, and much like Drew also, thought, well, I think we can do this, first of all, better. Second of all, it was fun. And then we just got to it and taught ourselves. Hendrik has been doing audio recordings for quite some years before, though, that I have to add. Can I ask, what were the what were the protests? What were people complaining about? What what, what did you find young players? Should I go in? The, should I go in detail? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, yeah, lightly, but like, you know, was it was it a? No, I mean, it's um, a lot of it in the beginning was that guitar festival and competition mindset that there was and not not a lot of communication with the outside world um just like guitarists playing for other guitarists kind of thing um and we were like guitar is pretty cool uh, all the people we know and hang out with uh, live with pretty normal lives but still from the outside it's considered to be something geeky nerdy whatever so we kind of wanted to show um, also to the outside world that is that it's very well possible to do this in a um, in a way that is communicating outside of the bubble okay yeah. reaching a wider audience reaching a wider audience yeah. hence also the interviews that we did with every artist of course mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that your styles are fairly unique um, and, uh, and, and and that might uh, have borne out as a result of being self-taught um i don't i don't, I don't know what what uh, what where do you come down on that are you asking me or drew both huh true <laughs> oh um uh, my style um it would be hard to pick down um i'm a very big fan of making things look um more or less realistic. I think maybe I'm not so much into the color grading side of thing um, and making things look filmic or whatever. I really much like to, very much like to capture what I'm seeing, but enhance it with you know very very beautiful lighting, um, you know sculpting the features of the face and and capturing what I think is very interesting at that point in the music, you know switching between right hand shots and left hand shots and using my knowledge as a guitarist to kind of influence how I, I will film the piece. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, I, I haven't really thought about my style per se. So um, I'm not sure if that's the answer you're looking for. Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, what's, I think what's really fascinating and, 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 and where the question is coming from is that um, I, I, I think that um, both of you have, have a fairly unique style from each other. Um, and also, I think, kind of from what we were seeing before you each kind of came on the scene. Um, yeah. and, and, and so how that, 
uh, materialized in your own in your own work. Uh, I, I'm 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 very interested in. So, uh, yeah, how how about you, Nicholas? The same 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 idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I I wanted to add also to what Drew said. I I agree with the not really having thought about my or our style a lot uh, because it's just what we happen to do um and um but now if i'm forced to look a little bit closer i i would say um first of all um open strings berlin is two people hendrix always been much more on the like technical uh, side of it and like got really into color grading and gave everything um a very uh, a very filmic look um cinematic and um for me what was and those two things work together what was for me always super important is the um, concept behind it so what piece is being played by whom so how do we present it in a way that the video and the music work together uh, to create like one new piece of art so it's not like the, our, our idea was never to um, to um, record a beautiful player or playing um, in a nice looking situation, but like the situation in which it is recorded also has to help the interpretation of the piece. It's interesting to hear you both though uh, comment that like you didn't think you had a style or it wasn't like immediately something that you went out to sort of achieve. And it reminds me, it reminds me of this really quite hilarious story. There's a comedian in Scotland. Well, he's not in Scotland anymore. He lives in America, but he's called Billy Connolly. Oh, yeah, and he's course. pretty international. You sort of, you, you, you know, he's really a super famous comedian. He's a, an older gentleman now. And he was, he has a hilarious sketch about reading an in-flight magazine when he's, you know, traveling somewhere. And it it's an interview about him and it's all about like his unique style and he's like oh fascinating because i didn't think i had one so he's like there reading this article like oh i'm going to find out what it is to do and the, the, the person writing the article says like billy Conley has this amazing ability to like go completely off on a tangent and you've no idea where he's going and then without fail he will land like a dart piercing back at the heart of the matter of the mastery exactly <laughs> and billy Conley was like well i get kind of back to the general vicinity like you know I kind of like I arrive somewhere on the same page but I, but I think this is tantamount to like you don't you're not aware of a style like maybe because you're you're sort of so involved in sort of doing it and making it that way and crafting it but like Matthew's absolutely right before I think open strings and Drew's work and was was so available to us on YouTube and on the internet there people were doing things, you know, and of course there's like people like Seacast Guitars and like GSI and stuff like that, but that they're very much about the guitar. They're centric to the instrument and sort of like, you know, they're not necessarily like you were talking, Drew, about, you know, the features of the player yeah. and that communication, that expressivity, which you capture so well. And obviously you think about the lighting so particularly to, 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 to show those expressions, you know, on people's faces. And um, you both do have a, have a style and like Matthew and I were talking about it when we were thinking about this episode and I was like it's you, maybe you're not so aware of it but we're kind of acutely aware of it actually interesting, interesting. yeah I'm a little I'm, I'm I'm a little surprised at your answers but I I it totally it totally tracks um uh, you know just given the conversations that Matthew and I had had um when we were when we were preparing for this conversation I was absolutely anticipating um, that you would both have this like kind of very clear origin story about like why you did what you did. But I love the fact that it comes from, I think, uh, just I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's some sort of process of discovery and that we, the viewers, are kind of watching that process in real time. I mean, what I, what I want to add to what you just said is that this reason why we or I then in this case started doing it is... Um, is very clear for us like mm -hmm. that that the fact that we didn't see a lot of like very very well done or yeah especially a lot of very well done videos like we have now mm -hmm. that wasn't that wasn't the fact when we started doing it absolutely and, uh, and then classical music videos have the tendency of being either poorly or overly produced <laughs> so uh, so they get very cliche and kitschy yeah. um which is also not what we wanted and that together with the community sense. So that was really, that was the main reason. And then everything afterwards with the style and everything that that just happened. 
Amazing. I think it might be time to hear, unless, Drew, did you have something I think you were maybe about yeah, to hear? Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking about um, my experiences. You know, a lot of the time, and I think this is where I differ from Nico, I'm really at the mercy of the venue the artist may happen to find. Um, so, because it's in Toronto, at least, it's kind of a nightmare to find a, a venue for a reasonable price. So, luckily, I have this one church that I, I go to and I sort of just kind of work with what I have mm -hmm. in the given situation and, and try to um, make all these different looks depending on what I think the piece, how the piece should be presented. So, whereas mm -hmm. Nico, I think scout locations and yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting to you, but because yes, the location plays a huge role in that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, we were lucky enough to be able to shoot like every video was shot in a different location that we did, um, and uh, the, maybe the difference is that, um, well, we are not dependent on the sound of the location, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, yeah, uh, forgot the other thing. That's okay. not... <laughs> Billy, Billy Cornyn, yeah. he'll come back, back to, back to it with exactly like, <laughs> precision. Well, listen, I think it'd be a nice to hear a little bit of your work, um, gentlemen. And we've actually got some quite technical questions coming in. So before we get into those, I mean, there's things about plugins and there's things about cinematography <laughs> and stuff like that. So we want to we want to you know answer these questions to the uh, the people in the community. But I think. Um, it would be lovely to hear a little clip um, of the wonderful Italian uh, guitarist Lorenzo Michele, who's just um, an absolute phenomenal musician and a uh, lovely guy. Um, and obviously Drew has worked with him a lot and also his uh, duo partner, Matteo Mella. So um, I'm going to uh, play a little clip. I think it's Gaspar Sands, Drew, right? Is that the... Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And then maybe talk about it after. Yeah, you can chat about it after, so we'll play that now and we'll have a little listen to Lorenzo playing um, some beautiful music by Casper Sands. <laughs> Come oh, on, man. <laughs> yeah. Lorenzo has such an incredible way of making everything he plays so personal, you know, and so touching. I, I feel like you capture that really beautifully, though, too. I mean, I, I, I agree, of course, but but I, I, I think that there's framing and I think that there's transitions and just how you're kind of seeing things yeah. and sort of bringing our eye and our attention to those things that you see, which I, I think is, is really, I, this is what I see in style. Um, and it's, it's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. That, that particular video was filmed in a little town called Crema, which is close to Cremona. And it was a pre pandemic video. Hmm. Um, and so I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Are you getting an echo? No, no, no. Okay, okay I'll ignore it. Anyway, so it was born in town called Crema, and um, I had no idea what the church looked like. It was sort of actually in that church, there are some Roman ruins along the side of it. So it's just whenever you go to Europe and film in these churches, it's such a different story than when you film in, you know, a North American church. So we had filmed for two days. This was the, the, the morning, the, the morning of the second day. We woke up very, very early. 
had some brioche, <laughs> went to the church, and the lighting was just gorgeous. And I think Lorenzo had planned to do this piece anyways, um, so which was just such a, a fortunate thing. And I just kind of put the camera down in an area that I thought looked great, you know, with the window behind him. And I was like, Lorenzo, go right now, play your piece. <laughs> and that's where we got that kind of main shot with the window. And then uh, the whole thing we probably finished in about 25 minutes because it's such a short piece, you know, set up a new angle and uh, hunt around and maybe ask him to do something again. But I love that video so much because it just, it was just like a gift. You know, the lighting was perfect. I didn't have to mess with anything. A ancient instruments record so easily. I don't know, Nico, if you've had the same experience. They always sound great, you know? So, yeah, and that was a very lovely time. As I was mentioning earlier, spending time with your friends doing this sort of stuff is, is just such a great experience. But that's the thing, like, working with natural light, you really sometimes have these moments. Yes. And they are absolutely unplannable also. I know, I know. <laughs> a few of my clients have caught like the perfect golden hour in the church I record. No. Um, but that makes it even more that makes it even more beautiful in the end. It does, yeah. And it yeah. was really only just a short moment that you had the chance to do it. Yeah, they have to be playing the right piece too, because if they're playing like the Chacon, <laughs> and they have to do two or three takes of it, no. exactly. <laughs> it's going to be totally different by the end. So. And it has to be usable, what they play. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> With Lorenzo, <laughs> I think, you know, 99% is usable. So. But this, isn't it funny when you when players um, players are very confident with dynamic, you know? Like, I think sometimes when we go to recording settings, the, the, the player sort of thinks there needs to be, like, a dynamic floor level here, you know? And Lorenzo is a player that sort of almost... <laughs> On those recordings seems to sort of ignore it and just does exactly musically what he wants to do like when he peters out to absolutely nothing because i've seen him do it live as well and it's like i think like matthew was saying it's incredibly impressive in a performance it's very difficult to capture in a recording and mm. i think you you set it up you set the ending up so beautifully actually you know coming out of that sort of close-up of the whale and then coming back towards the end you know mm. it's beautiful mm. um and that, I think it's, it's, it's very special quality to be able to see that in a player and then sort of think how best to present that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, for me, if, if the moment is very intimate, I'll try to choose the angle which was the most intimate, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess we're kind of unwrapping my style here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Maybe it's time to hear a little bit. Um, I wanted to add something to what you just said shortly. Um, there's a huge difference because we're talking about video. Um, psychologically, what is possible in, in the audio recording, what was possible and what can still transport, what wouldn't transport in a purely audio recording but because you see the person doing it you you can cope uh, you can make it up basically yeah yeah mm -hmm. so there's a there's an element of capturing the acting the gestural things exactly. of the performance yeah or just just like seeing somebody pluck a string is so right then if there's like hardly no sound you more likely accept that there's sound uh, rather than you don't see it and you have a very very Mm -hmm. Though uh, CD recording, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. If you see it, you believe it. Ah, it's okay. different. <laughs> it's like classical guitar vibrato. It's kind <laughs> of an illusion. Yeah, <laughs> true. You don't. You mean you don't have glissando oil? <laughs> I, use, I use glissando oil. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Um, so maybe we'll hear a little bit um, of, of of Nico and, of course, his colleague Hendrix's work now, um, and. You know, you can um, talk to us a little bit about what it. Are you going to play? I'm going to play the artist's guitar oh. duo, who are also oh. friends here in Glasgow. We've had them um, oh. here to perform as well. Incredible. Another, you know, just similar to Lorenzo, musicians have a really incredibly high caliber for you all to enjoy. So we'll have a little bit from the artist's guitar duo.
Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Stunning. <laughs> Excellent. Where was that recorded? The yeah. shot. Um, my living room. No. <laughs> <laughs> Re- recorded in my living room. Oh. Literally, yeah. The yeah. audio. Yeah. The yeah. audio. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and no, I'm actually not sure about that, but it happened many times and this one, <laughs> I'm not sure, but, um, the video is an old foundry and I, I chose this actually because I, I, I thought it might be interesting to talk about, Drew already said it a little bit, um, talk about like choice of location and, um, um, concept behind it and what, what limits there are due to location and what options there are with it as well. Um, and what 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 we did there, and we we always choose the uh, location together with the artist. But then in the end, Hendrik and I go and find it um, after talking talking to the artists about like what they what they see in this piece, how they interpret the piece, how they want to present the piece, and stuff like that. Um, and the, one of the first things that people think when they say Bach or hear Bach is church. And this is always, this has always happened, but for me, this is not really the, not really an option. It's a beautiful connection and churches can be super beautiful, but for, for what I want to, like, I, I want to go around at least one corner with, uh, if, if, if I'm, if, if I am going to record in a special location, I, I want to give it like that extra thought. Um, and since we're not, um, dependent on the sound of the location, we actually have the option to do that. So um, so if you think church, you think maybe cathedral, bigger room, lots of room, you hear a lot of room, so you want to see a lot of room, but then put it in a more contemporary style and at the same time mix it with that coziness of your living room, which is actually in the shop, like is half of what I have in my room standing there right now in Berlin, is that standing lamp, the carpet and this armchair. Uh, mm-hmm. This is and and what we do for um, more than just this one shoot is that we just travel with a lot of stuff. Also using public transport. There's I should I should have found this picture. There's a picture of us with the armchair and the lamp in the public transport on the way to that location. Oh, so um, this is this is what I this is what I like to play around with. Yeah. Um, in, in and then give give the piece like this extra level of interpretation yeah i mean i can i think i can vouch for that a little bit having done some open strings uh shoots that like you you your <laughs> your guitar playing is like it's part of it it's a part of it you know but your muscle is quite important too like you know you know you've, you've got to be able to like get involved you know it's fantastic fun you know it's great oh, like, 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 as, in, as in having a moving crew yeah is that what you mean <laughs> ah no. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. and also like you know, you, you've 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 recorded in some pretty uh, interesting places where you have to make maybe a quick exit. Also, <laughs> <laughs> also, not quite breaking and entering. But... Well, <laughs> the, 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 I'm not gonna I'm not gonna promote it, but the next one actually is. <laughs> um, well, listen, we've got a question on the screen screen from Anthony Joseph Landman and um, hey, Tony. Ah. Uh, there we go, Tony. So um, this one might be specifically, maybe, I mean, it's for both of you, of course, but um, thinking about your locations and design of, of, of that idea, I mean, do you, Nico, do you take any inspiration from any particular cinematographers or? I, I read the question, I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to sound so, sound so lame now, but I like not consciously, uh-huh. not consciously. I, li- I like movies a lot. I like uh, David Lynch a lot, stuff like that. But mm-hmm. um, I don't think it really is like actively visible in, or never, no. Not consciously. Not consciously. Okay. What about you, Drew? Is there anything there? Uh, cinematographers, not so much. But, well, I'm sure subconsciously I do. Like, I'll be watching a movie and think to myself, ooh, that could, I could maybe do something like that, and it would be really cool. But... To be honest, what I have on my computer are um, lots of photographs of, you know, particularly headshots of lighting I like. And uh, an activity I'll I'll do is just in my little man cave here is um, set up some lights and try to replicate that look 
like to a T just with me in, in the shot. And that's actually how I came upon the lighting for some of my recent videos, like the little Paganini sonatas. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. A, a, a colleague of mine, Pascal Valois has some beautiful promo shots. And I asked him like, Pascal, I sent him a side by side comparison. <laughs> so this is, this is called uh, how the sausage is made. Right. So, <laughs> and, do you mind if I do this? And he's like, no, please, it's my honor. So I was like, all right, great. We got some new lighting. So that that's, I do take inspiration, but it's from, from random sources and just according to what my instincts tell me. I have to say that's beautiful to hear also as, as a videographer, it's nice to hear you say that and also see it in your videos. <laughs> it makes me feel something. Okay. <laughs> The questions are flying in. Oh yeah, we've we've got a number. I I uh, do. Do you mind if I start with our, our buddy Harry Taylor's question? Oh, go for um, that one. First. Yeah, uh, uh, Harry Harry sent sent a question uh, before the the show, and for uh, our listeners, we would love uh, for for you to do this too. It's great for us to kind of get our head around uh, how what direction the conversation is in. We love for you to be a part of it. So Harry asks, what are the few really important things to get correct that will go 90% of the way to producing a great recording from your home studio. Oh, okay. Interesting. Nico, do you want to start this one? Um, so the, are we talking about video or both? Uh, audio, audio or video and audio? Let's sure. Let's talk audio and video, but maybe focus on audio uh, uh, at first because I believe that's probably where ha Harry's head is okay. is at. So the, then, then I'm already going to say that Drew is probably the more competent person to answer that. <laughs> but but I I want to I want to give this one thing into the conversation, and I would say it depends. It depends on what you want to record for. Hmm. Um, and for example, just using an example, what we sometimes had to do is use recordings that people brought, like mostly we do our own audio productions. And since we go into various different locations, we need to be able, we need to be, um, uh, we need to have a very flexible recording. So we need to be able to put in room afterwards or to, well, you can't really take out room that you recorded without major loss of the audio quality. And um, that's, for example, why we record everything more or less rather close, um, which works super well in locations where you would normally not think that it works well. But at the same time, all of you know that your guitar probably sounds amazing in your living room <laughs> because there's carpets there. There's like the sound wise, there's a lot of good things happening. Um, plus it's not the loudest instrument. Um, so you don't necessarily need big rooms. You don't necessarily need a church all the time. It really depends on what you want to do. This would be my answer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Harry asked, what are the essentials to get at 90% of the way to a good recording at your home? Is that what he said? Yeah. Yeah. Roughly, yeah. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> um, you need... I would say a lot of experience with a lot of different equipment and to do kind of a scientific scientific method of um, learning your equipment, learning about mic placement, um, learning about, uh, you know, how your room sounds. There's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to it because I think a lot, what a lot of people want is me for them to, is for me to tell them, you know, just buy a couple of line audios, put them here and you're fine, you know, yeah. 20, 20 inches away, but it's, it's really not the case. Um, so it depends what your room is like, you know, if it's a very reflective room, uh, you're probably going to have to mic closer to eliminate some of those reflections. Uh, and you're probably going to have to use a slightly more directional microphone, you know, to capture mostly the sound of the guitar. If you're in a great sounding room, you can use a microphone that's more open. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. There, there is no one answer to get to get 90%. Um, it's like everything else that's worth doing. It takes a lot of a lot of experience and, and a lot of trial and error, to be honest. Um, 
What but I would that? say maybe just some quick hints because I, I've given him nothing, right? Is uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's, more, he's more confused than before he asked. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> learn about uh, you know room sounds, um, and perhaps try lots of different microphones that will complement your sound. Yeah. You know, because I use different different mics for recording in my in my man cave than I use in the uh, in the church. Completely different microphones. Like the the microphones I use in the church will sound terrible in here, but those are the the good expensive microphones. But I use I use kind of cheap microphones <laughs> in in my studio because they um they're they're just complementary to the sound yeah. Yeah. that I want. Yeah, so, we found that to be true too. Yes. Yeah. I'd say, you know, definitely with classical recording, you, you need, you know, decent preamp and conversion because classical guitar is a very quiet instrument. So we will be turning up the gain. So you want like a clean signal. Um, but other than that, yeah, sorry, I can't give them, I can't give them. No, we're, we're, we're getting there. I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. I, I, I would say experimentation is probably the most important element of what of, of, of what you're talking about, Drew. At least that's 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 what I'm hearing you say. Um, and you'll probably always think it's about 90%. And that'll drive you to <laughs> do more and more to try and get it to 100%. Mm. I think it, it never happened. I think the percentage is um, the issue here because I, I I know Harry very well, and I think like he's looking to get he's looking to get ninety nine percent to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, I mean, I think um, it's hard when someone puts like a fraction, like something like that, on it and says like this. I mean, I, I think sometimes I, I'm doing the same thing with my mic placement just here in the gallery, and it sounds completely different. And it's it's my nails, it's the strings, it's the weather. You know, so actually that consistency of like, I know if I put the mic stand here, if I have this distance, I know this room really well, it still can change. Yeah. It can still change day to day. So the experience that Drew mentioned is maybe the key, like be happy to fail, be happy to make a bad recording and figure out why it was a bad recording, why there was too much nail noise. That's the best way to learn is to fail a whole bunch of times. To yeah. 10%, what, you know. <laughs> why Do you know I mean? Like, um, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about it. Like, we can probably answer Ryan's question because I think that is an absolutely direct question. He's asking, what type of microphone is better to record with, a condenser microphone or a shotgun mic? I have never had a good experience with a shotgun microphone. No, there we go. They always sound thin and terrible to me. So that's just, <laughs> we used some in a, we, we were forced to use some recording in an opera the other day because in, it's a big, beautiful hall, but we were very limited with where we could put the the microphones. So we were forced to use shotgun microphones, and that just reaffirmed my suspicions that I do not like shotgun microphones. Well, there you go, Ryan. You know not to go for the shotgun mic. The condenser microphones are better for sure. Yeah. So I, I, I just want to quickly add something, because Drew, you already said it about the getting to know your equipment very well. And then in the end, you can use a lot of different microphones to get a better overview. But in general, because I, I sometimes think about people who like don't necessarily have the means to buy a load of microphones or to or just get their hands on them. Um, in general, you can, with what you have, if you have one set of microphones, the range of what you can do and cannot do with it is amazing. So you, like, for example, if you think about buying an instrument, there are there are guitars that you can buy for a couple of hundred bucks that feel like they're over a thousand bucks. And then mm -hmm. there's like really, really bad, very expensive guitars. So yeah. Yeah. Um, it really depends on how you use it. So you first maybe start like really exploring your equipment to the fullest. Yeah. That was interesting. You mentioned Drew that you use cheaper microphones sometimes, like in just just in there in the room. Because like yeah. my microphones I use here in the gallery are not that expensive, um, and it's uh, th there's something about what you're saying, Nico, as well. It's like if you can, it's a bit like you were saying with the instrument. If you can get a good sound on not the most expensive instrument in the world, you know how to get a good sound as a player. And it's the same sort of thing. If you if you can work with what you've got, and you I mean but sometimes. There are some recordings out there that I've heard on, on YouTube and stuff, and I know what the person's using to record it, and it's not the best equipment, but actually they've managed to produce a really good... Yeah, yeah really good. the exact same experience. Yeah. Uh, are you using that, really? Yeah, yeah. You're like, wow, it sounds really good. I mean, yeah. 
we really, I think we really need to sort of, there's a few, there's this question from um, Joaquim Hernandez, which is probably quite a similar one, a simple one to answer, similar to Ryan's question. Um, he's asking how, how, well, how much plugins you use to record classical guitar, maybe something lost in translation, but what plugins do you use? Maybe he's talking about the digital audio workstation or, you know, maybe that's maybe more what, what he's looking for, but maybe you could elaborate a bit on that, Drew. Uh, yeah, well, I use a few plugins. Generally, in classical music, you don't use a lot of plugins um, because we're trying to capture the true color of the instrument. So what I have are very uh, utilitarian. So I, I like the Fab Filter plugins. So I use the, the EQ, um, the limiter, which you know just kind of raises the overall level of the signal, and the reverb. Uh, that reverb is a special one because classical guitar is a very unique thing to record and it reacts differently to different plugins, especially reverbs. So what I find a lot of reverbs will do is they'll kind of um, enhance that sort of um, edgy quality you can get with some recordings. Like it'll, it'll be a bit too reflective. So, but with the, uh, the fab filter reverb, it's always luscious and rich, which is what I think we're looking for. If I could just take a step back to mentioning um just we'll jump back to the plugins in a second but talking about learning equipment um and uh experimentation a very good thing to do is to load reference recordings into your daw listen to them and also try to replicate those in your room and you know being realistic trying to replicate something that that is recorded in maybe, you know, a studio, because that's kind of the closest thing, not a church, we're not gonna duplicate that. But um, uh, so that's where these plugins will help too, because everything's gonna have, have some reverb, but I thought it was worth mentioning, um, trying mm. to emulate, you know, the professional recording, something by Norbert or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. John Taylor as well, in the UK, John Taylor's a, a, is a, mm. is a great, some of his old recordings, not they're not not some of them are not that old as well. Um, are, are, are and actually how his recordings have developed over time, going from analog into digital. I mean, like mm -hmm. sort of, you can actually go back and you can sort of. It's funny now, like listening to a lot of recordings pre digital, mm -hmm. and trying to get that same warmth of sound and that mm -hmm. same depth of sound because it's sort of changed a little bit in the digital age to this crystal clear, yeah. high high fidelity recording that is very unforgiving and, and has led to because of the ease of editing but it's also played into that like you know i think the fact that such high fidelity has pushed editing it seems like a more natural process to do whereas you know the encapsulation of sound in some of the older recordings is is fascinating so we, we do that as players we copy we try not i'll emulate that vibrato or i'll try that articulation you know so i mean you i guess you're just advocating the same thing but from a an engineering point of view. Exactly, yes, yes. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, um, modern audio equipment is getting very crispy sounding. Um, mm -hmm. That's another thing, if you're getting into home recording, you probably wanna learn to read um, frequency response charts for microphones, because what we generally want for classical guitar is something with a very flat frequency response. And I think that's why, you know, um, a lot of home recordists are gravitating towards the octavas or the line audios, because it's generally kind of nice neutral sound. Whereas a lot of microphones these days will have quite a high lift around the 5K, 5 to 10K frequencies. And that unfortunately brings out all the sounds we don't want. It'll sound yeah. amazing on voice, yeah. Right, and it'll sound amazing when you layer tracks in in a mix, but for a solo classical guitar, we're going to hear all sorts of stuff. It's going to make our tone actually sound worse. Yeah. So you'll have. A, I would try. You know, trusting your instincts um, when you first plug them in. Like if it's generally okay, I think you're on the right track. But sorry, I totally lost track of what we were talking about there. No, <laughs> no, you're 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 right on it. In fact, uh, and, and this takes us to a couple of other questions that have uh, uh, been coming in. B essentially. Um, can both of you, uh, would you be willing to talk a little bit about your general setup when you are recording um, either audio or video or both, however it is, and we don't have, have to use specifics about mics necessarily, but I think it's more like what's your signal chain and how far are the uh, mics away from the instruments and that, that, that sort of thing. Nico, do you want to start? 
Yeah, that's we're gonna go really fast. Um, <laughs> um, we um, for video we don't really have it so much since it depends on on the location what and the kind of video we want to shoot plus we've changed equipment quite some time mm. we're on black magic for 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 a little while now but um but there are different cameras there and then sometimes two we also had three at, at times but um i think right now we're back to one mm. um and um audio wise pretty close miking um um uh road nta1 and an octava as uh, drew already talked about um uh, for bridge and neck and um that goes into a fire phase and that goes into logic <laughs> And then, like the, obviously, like microphone placing takes a little bit of time because even though it's most of the time it's those two mics, um, um, sometimes room depending on if we already know where we're going to shoot the video, um, we we can be free to like add some natural room, can be nice. It's actually nicer, um, and microphone placement then really depends on the player and the instrument. So you really have to like go around and use your ears mm -hmm. and then try stuff out. Yeah. And what about you, Drew? Um, well, for audio, I've been, I've been asked a lot. <laughs> so I'm finally going to tell people <laughs> um, <laughs> for, for the, because I just would never reply. So um, for the longest time, I've been using um, these, these old AKGs. Um, but they're not actually AKGs. They're, um, I have a friend who's, who's amazing. His name's Gord, and he might be watching. Um, and he heavily, heavily modified these things. Like, I can't even describe what he did to them because I'm not, I'm not into that side of things. But uh, uh, I used to have a very nice pair of Gefell microphones, um, and I sold them instantly as soon as I heard these things. So um this is what i have used for 99 percent of my videos for the past several years mm. um and they're they're omni <laughs> omnidirectional microphones um i love omnidirectional microphones because they seem in a good space to capture the instrument a bit more accurately and they make the the trebles just a little bit rounder and <sighs> What I do is when I have an artist in the church, I'll, I'll put on my headphones and just kind of hold the microphones like this and listen to them play and just kind of find the sweet spot. And it almost always ends up being, you know, the microphones maybe 40, 50 centimeters apart, you know, if the sound hole would be in the middle. And uh, I don't know, maybe like just, just past arm length away, maybe a little bit further than that because it depends on the church. The church I record in is very, very luscious, very reverberous. It's got, you know, several second delay. So I'm sort of forced to put the microphones a little bit closer to get that balance of detail and room. Um, so yes, that's what, that's what I use 90% of the time are some nice Omni mics. Um, but in the, in my home, I'll, I'll basically use some line audios. Um, I just got, got these, which I'm experimenting with these Sheps mics. Oh, oh, nice. They're lovely. But you know what? Um, the lines stand up. I'm not. I'm not kidding. The line audios are, are quite remarkable for their price. Um, so after that, sorry, after the microphones, I I've been going to the same equipment for a very very long time. So the um, the preamp is by Pueblo Audio, which is a very boutiquey kind of hmm. uh, preamp company, which I don't think anybody's ever heard of. Um, they they make a lot of preamps that are used on uh, Hollywood films and things like that. But it's it's a reasonable price. And then they go into uh, a prism interface, which just has very, very nice converters. So I would say that's complete overkill for somebody recording at home. It's just because I, I record lots of other artists um, and make money out of it that I, I invest a significant amount back into my gear. So I try to get the, the best that I can. So, um, And on the video side of things, um, the past few years, I've just been using Sony Sony cameras with prime lenses, meaning they're not zoom, they're, they're very fixed. They mm -hmm. live in a lot of light. They have a beautiful, uh, you know, um, 
blurred background and uh, editing in DaVinci Resolve. Really? Oh, same same for you, Nicholas. Yeah, DaVinci's amazing. Oh. Why? Well, okay, why did why DaVinci? Tell me. Well, I switched because I was using Premiere. I had a perpetual mm -hmm. license for I think it was called CS5 or something like that, mm -hmm. and it was great. I liked Premiere. Um, and then you know they did the subscription thing, so I was like, oh, okay, I'm sick of paying this amount of money, so I'm going to try DaVinci. Ah. And I, I kid you not, I learned it in a day, and it was it's so intuitive, and it has all the, the essential tools, like the color manipulation is second to none. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just incredible. So, I mean, yeah. I only I only use free programs these days. So for audio, it's Reaper. No kidding. Yeah, I love Reaper. I, I, I've used Pro Tools at, at the conservatory, but um, for classical editing, I will stand by Reaper 100% of the time for the, the speed at which you can edit, you know, the ripple editing, the instant crossfades, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, DaVinci Resolve, which is free, and uh, there was one more program I'm forgetting. Oh, and then for making my arrangements, this is totally different. Um, Muse Score. Oh, you use yeah, Muse Score, sure. They're all amazing. They're all amazing. Everybody, anyone listening, can just download them all right now for yeah. free. That's that's a good point. Uh, the DaVinci free version, we worked on that for two and a half or three years mm -hmm. um, until we got the the full version of it, um, and um, it is just an amazing program. The color grading tool is uh, absolutely mind blowing. Uh, it's easy to learn. Um, it's got some nice features that you, um, so basically you can do anything you want, anything you need for your purposes. Uh, also to work obviously professionally with the free version already. So, um, which is also not always the case. Um, and then, yeah. For us, it was just, we started with it. And since we shot the first 20 videos or something on a very cheap Canon camera, by the way, and it, it just, this again, what I want to say, it, not having top notch equipment is no excuse not to do it or not to like really invest in looking after something amazing looking or sounding. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do great things with light, with uh, will, with idea, with, um, I, yeah, I've, I've worked with people that have spent tens and tens of thousands of pounds on equipment and the recordings have sucked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. But listen, gentlemen, we have a, a fellow colleague who has joined us, Matthew Anderson. We're delighted oh, to bring you um, to the chat. Hello, hey, Matthew. Welcome. Hey, everybody. How are you? Uh, enjoying the conversation so far. I was hanging out in the, in the back room. So. Yeah, well, it's lovely <laughs> to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've actually played a little bit of both Drew and Nico's uh, work, just a couple of things, just to, to let people be. This might be a really nice opportunity to hear something that's non-guitar. And uh, would you mind if I played a little bit of that beautiful Chopin etude video that you made? And then perhaps, Matthew, after that, you could tell us a little bit about you know yourself and your experience in recording. But it would be a lovely way to introduce you would be just to hear some of that beautiful work. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is a, a, a beautiful uh, Chopin attitude and a stunning recording. Bravo <laughs> to the performer and yourself. <laughs> Great work. Yeah, it was one of my uh, former colleagues because I, you know, I used to teach at a college and 
um, he was a piano professor there, Alex Wasserman. He's a choir artist. So it was just amazing the opportunity to get to work with him. But um, now I'm actually settled in Phoenix. I just, I'm, I've been working with Arizona PBS for the last seven months, um, which is, has been a, a different, a different journey, <laughs> a different kind of journey. Um, but yeah, uh, but that was, uh, that was a really cool opportunity because that was actually the first time I'd been able to uh, do something that wasn't guitar. It was, it was um, working with piano. And I think we all like, especially when you work with guitar, you kind of know the angles that look good and the, the sort of the geometry of the instrument and the way you can kind of play that against the environment. Piano is for me was like the first thing I, I had to figure out is I got to get that overhead shot. <laughs> I really wanted that overhead shot. Um, and I, I heard, I was I listening to the guys, convers your, your conversation, you know, we, you, sometimes you just, you're trying to squeeze all the juice you can out of really terrible equipment. And especially with video, when you start getting into mixed machines, color matching and, and just shot matching becomes so much more difficult, especially when you're dealing across different platforms. So on that, I was dealing with like really not good Nikon cameras coupled with an iPhone. That was an iPhone that I was oh, wow. shooting down wow. with. And uh, basically, oh, oh. I had this uh, stand with a, a, a grip head and a giant wooden dowel. And I had a bunch of gaff tape, extra power source, and uh, recorded it. I used Filmic on my phone. But the hard part about that was actually getting all the, the color to match because those quiet wow. pianos had that, that gold inlay on the inside. And and um, that was just, that was, uh, I was really happy with how that turned out because there were just a lot of, a lot of difficulties in that particular shoot and that setup. Man, you did an amazing job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Amazing job. On that. Thank you. Yeah, it was, you would never know. <laughs> it was yeah, the, the, the beauty of the camera, right, is nothing's real unless it's on yeah. camera. So all the, the difficulties outside the lens don't exist anymore. <laughs> I wish we could yeah, say and I, and I just I think that illustrates a point that, that we keep coming back to, which uh, is it's not the gear, it's your use of the gear. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, sure, there might be uh, lots of things that uh, would would make your job easier as a videographer or a, as, as an audio recorder. Um, but the 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 real benefit of um, of the experience, you know, is, uh, is just, is just kind of pushing through it and figuring out solutions. Um, and it seems like recording, uh, this is my experience. Maybe this is, it seems like it's true for, for, for everyone else is, is, uh, you know, when we're recording, we're solving problems as many times, uh, or we're, or we're trying to solve, see what we're seeing in our head on a screen or like uh, out of microphones. And, and that's that, you know, that, that, that comes with a whole bunch of headaches, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, for sure. or challenges. Yeah. Or challenges. But, but, but I, think, I mean, the good thing about working with gear that doesn't really, you know, the, the I mean, it's obviously, don't get me wrong. Like I, I definitely like working with really nice gear, <laughs> but the, the challenge at the beginning when you're working with kind of less than stellar equipment, is yeah, you're really trying to rely on the vision you have, like where do I want this to go? And then you're just trying to maximize as you know, and it really forces you. I mean, for me in particular with the video, it really forced me to kind of get into the granular, like to where I was able to maximize maximize every single aspect of, you know, all the different parameters that you're setting your camera, you know, the exposure triangle, maximizing that understanding lighting like you know I, I feel like all of us if you're shooting video you're you know it'd be nice to have a lighting guy but we are we're the cinematographer we're the, the lighting expert the uh the you know the electrician on on site you're having to do wear all of these hats and for me that was I, I feel like when I started to really understand the lighting is when I really started to understand how to get the best out of, out of a really <laughs> crappy uh Mm -hmm. uh, camera set up so i feel mm -hmm. like if you have a, an amazing camera you can get away with less than stellar lighting because you're going to be able to shoot you know so much data that you could go back and kind of tweak stuff but when you're having to bake it in a little bit more 
you really have to get stuff right right out of the gate. So it becomes more of the the know how on the scene versus the know how I think in in post production. Um, it's interesting how everyone's come to that in their own kind of way. Like, and this is going to sound a little bit funny, but like you brought your lamp from your living room to that gigantic warehouse. <laughs> Drew tried to recreate the exact same lighting setup and still photography in his man cave. You know what I mean? And it reminds me of Julian Breen. The, in that great book Tony Palmer did, A Life on the Road, the, the Julian Bream book, Bream, when he does his car tours and, and travels all around Europe, takes the ferries over to Europe from England and then goes around, he brings his own lighting rig in the boot of the car <laughs> because he always knew he was turning up in these churches and they would have like a standard lamp and that would be the lighting on the floor mm-hmm. for the concert, you know. And wow. he, he just, he there's a beautiful bit in that Tony Palmer book where Bream sort of discusses the fact that lighting instantly makes the difference it yeah. instantly sets the scene you know and and focuses not just you as a performer and a player but it focuses the audience and the audience's attention so i mean it's 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 a it's interesting we, we, you know we've kind of come around to it doesn't need to be the world's most expensive gear and you need to know how to use what gear you've got and also the lighting is key i mean these are it's, it's fascinating because i think like some of our our audience watching you know some of the questions that have come in are so technical it's like mm-hmm. i think drew spoke to it as well it's like just tell me what i need to buy <laughs> <laughs> it'll all be okay right and wouldn't it be nice though <laughs> <laughs> well that, that that might be true for for some of our listeners and 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 fantastic uh i mean i i think we've uh gone through enough of a setup that you can more or less replicate whatever the signal chain is going to be with whatever uh, equipment you are buying, you listeners. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, how you use it uh, seems to be much more important, I think. In yeah, I will say lighting more than anything else is something where I think you can really go a long ways with very little money. I mean, obviously, it's nice to be able to buy like a really nice lighting kit, softbox, you know, very modular. But I mean, you can like you can get a frosted shower curtain and like a clamp lamp from Home Depot and yeah. then like a white plastic, like Coroplast from Home Depot. And you could have like a Roger Deakins ish, like double like diffused lighting setup. I mean, you can really like I built like a like a scrim gym that you could spend like. Four hundred dollars at B and H. I built one out of like PVC for like twenty dollars. Like, mm-hmm. like I don't. I mean, I don't think you can really do that with anything else. Like, you're not gonna like. Oh, I went and bought like some electronics and built my own microphone for like. <laughs> Probably not gonna do that. But I think that if you were describing a scene from American Psycho, or breaking, breaking <laughs> 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 so these and like duct tape. I'm like, uh, listen. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we, we don't have to talk about what happens after you record. It's just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, was, I was getting some weird looks going in there. So. Dealing with challenges, we, we are in the midst of, middle of a rainstorm here, and oh, wow. um, the studio here is up in the very top of the house. So if you can hear crashing, oh, wow. yeah, it's, uh, wow. that's Glasgow for oh, you. That's, wow. got, that's why it's so green here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could all answer this question. Uh, it's, it, I think it's a really good question, and it's from Sebastian. So we'll maybe go around Drew, Matthew, and then Nico. Um, and it's, um, hmm. what is a piece of equipment that you bought and regret? Not a college diploma, mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, an actual piece of real real equipment. So maybe Drew. Oh, you know, wow. Uh, wow. Ooh. That's a tricky one. I I don't think I've regretted anything I've bought, to be honest. But mind you, I do a lot of research, and it's very easy for me to rent equipment at stores, you know, to make sure I like it first. So, yeah, I got to say, I don't have any regrets. Screw you. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Matthew? Uh, I have a regret that's not really the equipment. It's I, I wish I would have spent more to sort of get the next model was a, a gimbal I bought um, a Zion I got a like right when the Zion gimbals came out with their the Weeble lab I got one and which I liked I like having a gimbal but I realized pretty quickly as soon as I put 
a heavier lens on it, it became useless. It just, it wouldn't get very smooth. Yeah. It would just kind of like anytime I'd move, it would, you'd see these little jitters. Mm. So I, I realized like pretty quickly, like, Oh, and it, it, it was one of those things where the, the spec said it could handle the weight. I didn't really uh, think that to myself, like they were probably exaggerating. <laughs> I should have stayed kind of in the sweet spot and I didn't. So that was the, my regret of spending a lot of money on a gimbal that I could probably only use for like home movies. <laughs> um, I, I, first I was like Drew also thinking, I, I don't think I really have anything that I really regret because also renting a lot. Um, and now I'm thinking, I think there's a lens flying around for my old, do you remember the old black magic design pocket cinema camera, the yes. very small one. So we used to have that. We used to shoot on the old cinema camera and the pocket cinema camera with microphone or thirds mount. And, um, I don't know what got into me, but at some point I bought a, I don't know what it even is, a seven millimeter or something fisheye mm -hmm. lens for it. And I have never used that <laughs> because it looks horrible. <laughs> you can't do anything with the picture. I, 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 I want to say it might have been during the first lockdown and that for a time was my camera that I had to do my lessons with or something. And that might have been the only lens available on eBay from somebody who wanted to meet and uh, exchange equipment or, so or something. I think it was, but that's already three years ago. I don't really. So that, that would be one. Fish, fish eye lenses for a classic guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Skateboard, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so maybe it's time to hear a little bit more of, of your work. And, and we're, we're just over the hour mark, I think, in the show. So we won't keep everybody for too much longer. But it would be just lovely to hear a little bit more. Um, and we'll go back to Drew. And we're going to play an incredible recording um, uh, of some Vice. And then after it, Drew, you could tell us maybe a little bit about the artist and also uh, the recording in question. Musician, right there. <laughs> serious, serious guitarist. Yeah, I hope she's watching too. Uh, Petra's, yeah, wonderful uh, person and guitarist, and very, very easy to work with. Um, have you know, having recorded a lot of people, some people are very comfortable in the role of being recorded, and some people are not. But she is very, very comfortable. So we do very few takes. Um, and it's great because, you know, for every angle I might shoot, 99% uh, is usable. Wow. So, um, yeah, and that was filmed in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, so every year we both uh, meet at the International Guitar Festival there. Um, I think Armin Kelly is the 
is the guy who runs it. And Jason Vio is around, but uh, not every year. So yes, and we have plans this year when Solodo is going to be there as well. But uh, we're going to do a very special video that Armin's been uh, har harassing us to film for a few years. <laughs> Armin, <laughs> we're going to do it, okay? <laughs> you caught that. You said it. <laughs> no, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. So that sounds amazing. Yeah, and that guitar is amazing. I didn't even mention that guitar. That nine-string guitar makes um, Vice actually, you know, playable yeah. <laughs> on a guitar-type instrument. Yeah, right. so. <laughs> guitar-type. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> Vice. Vice just does not work on a six-string. I'm sorry. Like the majority of Vice, maybe a yeah. little, a little bit works, but it's so awkward. You know, just yeah. going from one crazy chord to the next. But mm -hmm. the nine-string it just frees up your hand to to play more beautifully. Mm -hmm. So she takes full advantage of that. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Um, and maybe we could hear a little bit um, from from Nico's output. Now, this is a, a recording of Fabian Zeller um, and very different entirely to uh, what we just heard from Petra. So I'll play this and then invite you to discuss it afterwards. <laughs> So <laughs> we, 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 forgot, we forgot we wanted to sh show some behind the scenes pictures. They were not part of the actual video, <laughs> <laughs> but we also forgot they were there. <laughs> yeah. but they're beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah, very beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So that happened. <laughs> yeah, we'll tell us about that, you know? Um, that was, I think it was the second picture. In the first picture, you saw what it looks like to 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 try to bring a piano bench to a construction site that is like at least four meters down because they 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 took down a house and there was water everywhere and because it had rained and but it was summer also so it was boiling hot and ah. there was a, basically it was a ruin and we kind of tried to fall not to fall. <laughs> but we kind of fell in there, um, not really asking anyone. That's the, mm. um, the that's the video where we, or one of the cases where we had to actually like do something like this in order mm -hmm. to get a location that we really want. Mm -hmm. um, um, so breaking and entering. <laughs> <laughs> Some people yeah. say. <laughs> Some people might call it that. I don't. Yeah, understand. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I, I, I think we made a video. Yeah, and who is Fabian? Uh, Fabian is an amazing uh, guitarist who studied and uh, lives in Dresden. He studied with maybe you can hear it in the playing and the way he composes his own music. That he uh, comes from that school of uh, fingerstyle um, world music acoustic guitarists uh, around Thomas Fellow, um, where also a lot of our ar other artists come from. Leon Albert, Jule Malischke. Mm -hmm. um, and so he wrote that piece himself and um, we tried to put it in context basically and mm -hmm. then that plays really much for a piece that is called children of gaza um pretty much was was the perfect location to do it mm -hmm. yeah. that's yeah and then, i love i love that phrase putting putting the piece in in context uh, that I, I think I think we can we can also add that to a stylistic consideration that is a very much a 
uh, a part of Open Strings um, Berlin videos, and it's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the I remember that it, especially in this case, we it it wasn't an easy decision, or it's like it's never an easy decision, but with a topic like that. Or with some other topics as well, it can be like you really have to be able to stand behind it afterwards. Yeah, um, because so obviously you can always always say that was artistic freedom and whatnot, but um, that's also sometimes an easy excuse. So um, the the fine line between making this cliche and only like scratching the surface and uh, I don't know. Um, exploiting it for uh, for very obvious uh, or in a very obvious way is not an option. So we either had yeah th there was that um, consideration that consideration, and then the other the other version of doing it would have been basically in a white room or something <laughs> where yeah. there's nothing there. Yeah, right. And the everything in between we had to kind of like level out and f see what what we can do and what we can stand behind and whatnot. Mm. Awesome. Well, we have a lovely uh, clip as well, uh, uh, following on from your Chopin, Matthew, um, a lovely clip of some Granados now as well. So we're going to play that, um, a piece that all the guitarists listen will be familiar with, the Spanish dance uh, by Granados. And now which one is that? What you're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> um, Matthew, I love how you decided to keep um, to, to take out movement when things are slow and then add movement when things are getting a little bit faster. It really felt very natural and, and uh, it's gorgeous. Great playing, too. Yeah, this was um, it's funny that you say this because this was one of the pieces. I think we've probably all done this where you kind of I, I don't know if you kind of start to develop a philosophy, so to speak. Like, you know, I, I kind of want to sort of capture things in this way at these moments or I want to cut at certain times or and, and obviously like trying to keep things flexible where I'm trying to just make sure um as, as you know, we just talked about with contextualizing pieces, like making sure that the visuals are kind of growing organically out from the piece as much as you can. I mean, obviously, sometimes you don't know what you have until you're in, in post-production. But um, Scott, I mean, working with Scott is just is uh, so much fun. I mean, Scott's just a ball of energy and, and just uh, such a like a explosive player especially in the louder stuff but when it got pulled into that really those delicate moments it was nice to just really push in on that because you know if you kept going then you know it just got ex really big and explosive again right after that um and that venue that was a really interesting opportunity um that came 
uh, Adam Kostler um, had reached out to me um, about doing some video. This is right when COVID, I think this is like a few months uh, in, into COVID. I, for, I forget exactly. It might have been the first winter uh, of after COVID hit. That was at the George Washington Masonic Memorial in Washington, D.C. So everything was oh, shut wow. down. And uh, Bill Fonville, a guitar builder who actually works in the um, the basement, was basically like, "Hey, we can get you guys in if you want to shoot some video in here." And wow. so we drove, you know, me and, and my uh, friend Dusty, we we drove up and met uh, Adam Scott um, and a few other players. Did did uh, we just did three or four days of video? And originally, we were just going to be in an auditorium there where they used to do like Alexandria guitar festival concerts or something like that, um, that which they don't do anymore that we're going to do that. And because it was shut down to really very limited visitation, we played nice and we kept asking very nicely, Hey, can we explore other places? <laughs> and they gave us, you know, okay, you can do it in here. So we went in there and the very last day I knew I'd seen pictures that up in the spire in the tower, there's a museum that has all this black and white marble. It's just really beautiful. And I knew I wanted to get in there. And, uh, but it was a, you had to go up this old, like 1930s elevator. And uh, so we kept having to load gear up, go up, unload, come back down, load gear. And we did a, a, a shoot in there. The, the problem that, that was another one. There were a lot of problems because uh, there was limited power. Um, so I had to run a bunch of, um, basically like behind the camera it was just like a spaghetti plate of <laughs> cables running power and then um the, it was in the middle of winter in dc area so it was really cold and the heater kept coming on but it was on an old boiler system so it was really really loud so we kept basically i when we were setting up i timed it and i knew it would we'd have about 45 minutes and when it kicked on it would run for 20 minutes and then it would kick off we'd have like 45 minutes oh, wow. so basically we're like <laughs> i'm just sitting there with my like with my touch like everything's ready oh. like it's about to go off <laughs> and it'll go off oh, and hit record and we God. just get as much done as we could and, uh, that day was with um adam and scott and dusty i think where it was the th the three of them that recorded in there at that that point so we didn't have a whole lot. There's another video I did of Adam and Scott playing the this duo arrangement of WC that we did in there, that same spot as well. Um, the venue is amazing. I mean, it was really great. To, it was a cool place to get kind of B-roll footage as well. I just walked around with the gimbal and got images of like George Washington statues and all this like museum uh, images. And uh, but that one was a, there was a lot of experimentation video wise in there because i was um i had a lot of motion built in like uh slider motion and of course just you know normal fluid head stuff but i started that one was where i really started pushing to see how much automation like how much zoom i could build in in post before the image started to kind of fall apart so i was really trying to push it to create a little bit more three-dimensional movement instead of just like along a particular axis I was creating more like actual like dolly style motions as much as I could. Mm. Um, and the lighting in there was really nice. So I, I ended up when we got in there, there was a lot of natural light, but it still was kind of wasn't enough. So I basically tried to set up the lighting as much as possible along one sort of spot to make it seem like it was getting a lot of natural light kind of flooding in from where it was already kind of coming in, but I was just trying to augment that as much as possible. Um, yeah, it was, it was one of those, uh, you know, those kind of jobs where you're <laughs> just running around with like a chicken with his head cut off. You know, you're mm. <laughs> just want to be able to sit in there and, and play director for a moment and sit behind the camera and get all these great shots. And there I was like having to stopwatch time the boiler and then, you know, the elevators, if it would kick on, we'd get that noise as well. And then I'm trying to run, you know, different oh. camera. So beautiful. Was, wow. That's heroic. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, yeah, you just have a medal, man. <laughs> like, I remember recording in cathedrals where like heating would go off and then all the pipes would ping. <laughs> so, and the pipes basically sort of like they'd obviously full of hot liquid, hot water, and then as they come back to their original <laughs> side, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you'd be playing along, you'd be like, oh, I've got this harmonic section, it's perfect. And you'd hear like, 
ping, and then there'd be the music yeah. on that ping as well. And you'd be like, okay, we'll just sit here for 20 seconds while that dies out, like you know. Um, the, the beauty of those um, those situations is if then something else goes wrong, for example, I don't know what battery falls down and the other one's not fully charged yet, or anything, and you have that 45 minute gap in which you can do something, then, yeah. you, then you lose that, or you'll end up with, okay, now we have five minutes to do like. <laughs> yeah, can, can you get this in one take? Yeah. <laughs> and, right, that's all your life. And cool. can, you maybe, can you maybe play a bit faster? <laughs> uh, well uh, my friends uh, now that we've scared everybody away from ever doing any video um, i think this is probably a good time to say uh thank you to to everybody that's watching online and very much thank you to our guests drew nicholas matthew thank you for your insights thank you for being uh, a part of this uh, conversation for you at home. Thank you very much for contributing to the conversation. Um, the next episode of Duo Talk will be Sunday, April 2nd. We'll be covering what I'm pretty sure has been our most requested topic, uh, the lives and the music of Ida Presti and Alexander Lagoya. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you'd like to be part of that conversation, please uh, send us your questions um, in advance or fill up the chat box. Uh, during the live stream. Before we go, Matthew, can I just jump in to say, I think that there's so many people have asked questions and some people have said, I just joined the conversation. Uh, and probably you've already discussed this. I'm going to go back and watch it. We would love to have all of our guests back on in the future for another, I mean, even we could even go into maybe a more specific area, you know, of something, you know, uh, about recording and things like that. And it, even if it's projects that you, you guys are up to as well, or you want to sort of highlight a recording or a release or something, maybe an artist, you know, stay in touch with us and stay in touch with the community because we'd be delighted to have all of you on again. Cause I feel like we just got started tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was yeah. nice. Let's do it again sometime. For sure. Uh -oh. Absolutely. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a great idea. Well, thank you so much for having me and, and really nice to, to see everyone and, and uh, respect everyone's work. I mean, I, it's a, a source of inspiration for me. So I, I, it's an honor to be on the, the panel. <laughs> so delighted to have great. you, sir. Wow, yeah. Great to have you. Yeah. Excellent. All right. We'll see you all soon. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Bye thank bye. you very much. Nice thank to you see too. you and meet you all, by the way. <laughs> Great.